consider that a terrific uh, effort on your part and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, one other little bit of housekeeping. Sid, would you stand up just a moment, please? <laughs> a lot of you know Sid Jones, and then uh, probably quite a few of you don't. So I wanted to introduce Sid. I'll be sweeping uh, out the room after you. <laughs> uh, Sid has worn a lot of hats in his uh, career, uh, but uh, the hat that's most important to me and to tonight's presentation is he is an outstanding hydrogeologist, and uh, without his expertise, uh, this uh, study that we did never would have been completed. Uh, I'm a geologist, which is a far cry from hydrogeologist. I've been in a lot of caves, but uh, I don't really know much about how water moves through them. So Sid's expertise was critical to uh, what you're going to see here. All right. Uh, on April 25th, which by coincidence, or maybe not, uh, was Earth Day in 1994, some workmen were building a sign, masons I think, kind of a stone and wood sign, at the entry to uh, Maple Trace subdivision, a very small subdivision off of South Maple Ave. They heard a great whooshing noise followed by an explosion. Uh, they dropped their tools and went up to see what in the world had happened. And what they found was a big hole in the ground had opened up dramatically and suddenly. Uh, the sinkhole, you see the deepest portion of it here, but it actually measured 101 feet long and 43 feet wide and 30 to 35 feet deep. What you see in the photograph is mostly dirt, but the collapse actually broke through eight and a half feet of solid bedrock uh, that was the roof of the cave. So, oh, and the, the whoosh was the rocks and earth falling into the cave and the air rushing out. The explosion, we don't know quite what that was, but a power pole uh, was dropped somewhat and tilted, and we suppose that some electrical thing happened that uh, blew up a transformer or something. Uh, is that what happened? Yeah, correct. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll see, now I've learned something about this. Anyway, this collapse broke through into a cave that hitherto had had no entrance big enough for human beings to go in. Uh, as soon as cavers heard, out, heard about it, found out about it, we were uh, on the site and going in as fast as we could. It is what uh, cavers like to call a virgin cave. No human being has ever set foot in it or laid eyes on the inside of the cave. That's the prime booty that cavers like to find. In spite of being a virgin cave, in spite of the fact that we were the first people into it, it was one of the most totally trashed caves I've ever been in in my life, with all kinds of urban debris in prodigious quantity and variety. Aluminum drink cans, cigarette butts, toys, a plastic milk crate, automobile parts, a baseball bat, a cooking pot, shoes, a lawnmower wheel, five gallon buckets, lumber, motorcycle tires, one unopened and full beer, which we salvaged, <laughs> a shopping cart basket, and over 30 tires, automobile tires. We mapped a cave some 2,082 feet long. It has a, well here's the, where the collapse took place, and this is a fairly large entrance chamber, and then the downstream section is really not too long before it enters, before it ends in a permanent pool of water and you can't go any further unless you've got scuba gear. The upstream section uh, is considerably longer, about 1,200 feet long, uh, counting the side passages, and this was accessed by crawling through a small opening in these breakdown blocks that partly filled this room, and then dropping down through a hole about, what would you say, around eight feet, into a a uh, pool of water, and, uh, and as you drop down that first time, you're thinking, how do I get back up? In any case, uh, we managed to work our way through the big pile of breakdown here and get into this rather large passageway, and we thought, we've got 
a virgin cave that's going to go a long distance. Virgin cave, but trash. And I submit this is probably the only cave map in the world that actually has uh, automobile tires mapped on it. The uh, black circles that you see in some places are some of the automobile tires. We found over 30, and that gave the cave its sardonic name, Tires to Spare. Okay. These four tires in the bottom of the breakdown uh, have been pushed on into the cave now by floodwaters. Uh, in one part of the breakdown, back in the entrance chamber, we were able to get down in the breakdown and see tires that were being forced by water pressure through holes that were too small for the tires to go through. But the tires were bulging into these holes from the water pressure that sometimes moves through this pile of breakdown during flood. Uh, when we get to the far side of the breakdown pile, we discovered that a lot of trash was uh, getting caught in the breakdown. The breakdown is, in effect, a filter, just like a fuel filter in your automobile fuel line. Uh, gasoline flows through the fuel filter. There are little bits of trash in the fuel. It's not supposed to be there, but it is there, and it gets collected in the filter until the filter gets stopped up because it's doing its job then you have to replace it or your car won't run. We have a natural filter here now for the storm waters that flow through the cave. Uh, the waters can flow in between the rocks and through the rocks, but the trash that they carry can't. So the trash is collecting here. And as I said, it was an amazing quantity of trash, and we wondered uh, where it was coming from until we found this Rose's shopping cart basket, and then we knew exactly where it was coming from. And Rose's department store, which used to be the store that anchored the South Willow um, shopping center, been gone for a long time now. But when we found that, and also we found plastic ties, uh, which are used to seal cargo trucks, uh, we found plastic ties from institutional wholesale company and from the Dr. Pepper bottling plant uh, in the same area, uh, we had ample proof of where the trash was coming from. And the only possible source for these particular bits of trash would have been for it to come down the concrete line canal that you see along South Willow Avenue and to turn and follow that canal and go into Enzer Sink, which has an open cave entrance. Okay, Enzer Sink's 4,000 feet away from Tires to Spare Cave. And we thought, uh, how, how about that? We've got a big cave that's probably over a mile long because 4,000 feet straight line, the cave doesn't go straight line, the cave's doing like that. And we expected to have a big cave to follow a good long distance. Uh, it was not to be. About 700 feet uh, upstream from the pilot breakdown, the cave ceiling came down dramatically and there's a pool of water there, and you can't go on unless you have scuba gear. So, we know there's a big cave there, but we can't get into it because of this sun. Would it be possible to go around the Enzer Sink and get in? And the answer is no, and not only no, but you don't want to do it even if you could. Uh, the water there is pretty horrible. 30 to 40 feet inside the open cave entrance at Enzer Sink, there is another sump, or permanent pool of water. And as you see here, it has lumber, a bicycle tire, a five-gallon bucket, and uncountable amounts of plastic bottles and styrofoam cups. And we have also seen an office chair, at least two shopping carts, uh, sections of garden hose, uh, coils of wire, and all sorts of things feed into uh, the sinkhole headed underground into this underground uh, drainage. So, nobody's getting into this cave from downstream or upstream unless they're divers, and uh, it would be an exceedingly hazardous dive. If you can imagine a diver with tanks going down through rolls of wire, pieces of lumber, shopping carts, and all that, it would be, it would be <coughs> difficult. Access then to uh, most of this cave is blocked off by permanent sumps, water pools, 
at each end. We already knew where the water was coming from on the basis of the shopping cart and the uh, truck uh, closure tags, uh, but uh, and we actually uh, claimed uh, credit for doing the world's first underground stream tracing by a shopping cart, but uh, <laughs> this is not uh, not really scientifically acceptable, and so we went back to do it the standard way of putting some dye in the point where the water was going underground and putting dye receptors to catch it at the possible points where it might uh, be seen further downstream. We put dye receptors in Tire to Spare Cave and in several other places. Uh, turned out that dye receptors weren't necessary. We had, whoops, a glorious positive to uh, quote uh, a world famous hydrogeologist, Jim Quinlan. Uh, this is Pigeon Roost Creek, just downstream from where uh, the most of the water in Pigeon Roost Creek comes out of Amit Cave. And uh, although we, we proved the connection from Intersink to Tires to Spare to Amit Cave to Pigeon Roost Creek, uh, some of the people who live a little bit further downstream and found the stream in their backyard turned blood red were not exactly as pleased about this as we were. Uh, <laughs> It was a miscalculation, and I should clarify that neither Sid nor I designed this diet test. That was a, a, a different hydrogeologist that, that did that, and he miscalculated on the amount of diet to be applied. Well, we also have to add that we didn't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Inser Sink. Everybody knows where Inser Sink is, right? There's a little park there, the Inser Sink Natural Area, rather a misnomer because it's been so modified, not natural, but in any case, I'm glad we have a park there. Uh, Inser Sink, in the middle of Inser Sink Natural Area, is the sink point for Breedings Mill Branch, which used to be a natural stream that drains about 800 acres of Cookville. The Breedings Mill Branch drainage basin includes both residential areas and commercial areas. At the time of our study, which was 1998 to 2002, uh, about one third of this drainage basin was covered by impervious cover, by which I mean paved parking lots, paved city streets, and the roofs of houses and commercial buildings. Anything that prevents the water from soaking into the ground when it rains, impervious cover. If it can't soak into the ground, what does it do? It goes laterally towards the nearest creek. And it gets there fast because it flows pretty quickly across the pavement. In 1984, the city of Cookville spent over $611,000 to improve the stormwater drainage in this Breedings Mill branch drainage basin. They hired a Nashville engineering firm to, first of all, clean out the swallet, the cave entrance at Inger Sink. It was completely clogged with limbs, tree trunks, brush, and uh, urban debris. In addition to that, they lined about 750 feet of the stream channel in the sinkhole with riprap, uh, big blocks of limestone, just broken rough quarry limestone. The idea of lining the channel with these heavy blocks of riprap partly was to preserve or stabilize the stream channel and to preserve multiple infiltration points. The water can sink between these blocks and get on underground. Turned out to be somewhat counterproductive because floods are rolling these blocks down into the entrance of Inser Sink and they're now becoming part of the problem. The third thing the engineering firm did was to convert Breedings Mill Branch from a fairly natural stream into the concrete line canal that you see along portions of South Willow Avenue now. And that canal turns and goes over to Indersink Park and delivers uh, water from uh, the drainage basin into the sink. Let's see, okay. There's the swallet itself in Indersink with one of seven shopping carts uh, that we found in the stream bed moving in flood pulses bit by bit inexorably into the cave. Uh, two of them made it into the cave uh, while we were doing this study. These are uh,
the broken blocks of limestone riprap, and I don't know where they first put them, to what extent, but they have been gradually moving down into the cave and helping block the drainage rather than preserve the drainage. Due to the combination of this canal, the cement canal that delivers rainwater so fast to the sink, uh, and uh, due to the fact that we have so much impervious cover that sheds water into the canal uh, quickly, Inter sink tends to flood uh, frequently and rapidly. It's what we call flashy. It will flood rapidly, the water will come up in it rapidly and then drain back down rapidly. So there's Dr. Jones standing uh, somewhat precariously by this raging flood water and, uh, at 5.30 p.m. And then a mere 20 minutes later, the flood level has dropped uh, a good eight, six or eight feet. In the first picture, the swallet or entrance to the cave is completely underwater and invisible. In the second picture, it's coming into sight again. Um, Mostly, flooding takes place within the sink and doesn't really cause any problem. Occasionally, though, the flood levels will back up high enough to spread out through the chain link fence that separates the public areas of Intersink Park from this uh, sinkhole proper. And occasionally, uh, they do more than that. Uh, here you see Inter Sink flooded to the depth that it has backed up and covered the Clover Street, Clover Hill Drive bridge. And there used to be two little houses in this neighborhood that were periodically flooded during uh, heavy rainfall e events. The city purchased these houses, I think uh, using some information supplied by uh, uh, Sid to uh, acquire federal FEMA uh, grant and uh, uh, took these houses down and solved that problem. Didn't solve the flooding, but at least solved the problem of houses uh, being flooded. Okay. Adjacent to Inzer Sink is a second sinkhole that we call Walmart Sink. Walmart used to be right next to this sink. They long ago moved to their present location, but the name has stuck for the sinkhole, Inzer Sink. Uh, Walmart sink. These two sinkholes, Inzer sink and Walmart sink, are normally separated by a low topographic divide. Oh, I forgot about that one. Uh, well, I can't rearrange the order of these pictures, so I better tell you about this one. Kids like to play in this canal. It makes a great place to race your bicycle when it's dry. It makes a fun place to do something with your bicycle when it's wet. And uh, it's not hard to imagine a kid misjudging the depth and swiftness and force of the water and getting down in here and being swept away. And if a kid were swept downstream in the inter sink and drowned and the body went under, then uh, probably there would have to be divers called in for a body recovery. And you might just wind up having someone else drowning because of the hazards of that particular cave. I'll get back to that uh, later on, but let's see. All right. Next to Inter Sink is a much smaller sink that drains 150 acres, and it's called Walmart Sink, and it's down there in those trees. Normally, this is dry land, part of Inter Sink Park, and when I took this picture, I was standing in waist-deep water. Behind me and to my left was the structure called the council ring, some stone benches and a stone table, uh, completely inundated. And uh, this sinkhole merger occurs when Intersink floods to a depth of 33 feet. Then it overflows and joins Walmart uh, sink. So that's mainly background so far. Now to get to the uh, nitty gritty of the study that Sid and I did, the primary purpose of the study was to better characterize the flooding. How often does it happen? How deep does it get? Uh, and to try to figure out how fast Intersink can drain and get rid of the water. Uh, 
And uh, to do this, we uh, were aided by the city of Cookville that provided a $10,000 grant, and uh, we were able to purchase some instruments that we needed. Uh, our time was uh, volunteer. Uh, so here's a map that shows some of the drainage features in Cookville. Capshaw Cave here is actually, I'm told, one of the longest known caves underneath an urban area in the United States. It's over four miles of cave map from the entrance right beside uh, South Maple and through various sinkholes not shown on this map, a large part of Cookville drains through this cave, comes out at this big spring here, and then runs across the surface of the earth in, in a short stream called the canal before it goes uh, under again. This is actually probably a de-roofed cave, a cave that long ago uh, fell in. That's outside of what we're looking at. Though. We're looking at uh, Regan's Mill Branch, no longer a natural stream, but a straight cement line canal, uh, and then it comes around here to enter St. Cropper and drains about 818 acres. Then we have Walmart sink here, which drains about 150 acres. And then there's some other uh, sinks, this one called Red Cap Sink. And uh, we'll ignore that one. I don't remember the name of it in one part of our study. The dye trace that we did in April of 1995 established positively that drainage from Inzer Sink passes through Tires to Spare Cave and then goes in to Amit Cave, resurges down here at Amit Resurgence, forms Pigeon Roofs Creek, goes on down to Center Hill Lake, and then we pump it back up here and drink it. Uh, but, but Ronnie takes care of that for us, don't you? <laughs> um, we actually expected the tide to come out here at this resurgence. It did not. It flows through the cave, through the entire spare cave, and bypasses that resurgence. Interesting. A second dye trace was run with the dye injected at Walmart sink, and it too flowed through tires to spare cave uh, and joined the waters of Amon Cave, etc. A final dye trace was done at Red Cap Sea, and it was a little surprising. Uh, it split and went two ways. Some of the dyed water came out at uh, Capshaw Resurgence, and some of it flowed through Tire to Spare Cave. It's really the underground equivalent of an island. Uh, on the land stream split, go around an island, come back together. Same thing underground, harder to see, harder to predict. The drainage basins for Breedings Mill Branch and for the Walmart Sink area were delineated using a topographic map with a two-foot contour interval that's fairly detailed, augmented by the tracing that we did. Uh, so we know pretty much where the water's coming from and where it's going. Now we'd like to get some quantifi quantification. We need to know how much rainfall is falling that produces these floods. And part of the city grant was used to buy a rainwise tipping bucket rain gauge, which was installed uh, in front of the big parking lot uh, where it rose in front of the South Willow Shopping Center, near where El Tapatio is now. Uh, this is not your household rain gauge. You know, your household rain gauge, it rains all night. You go out and you look at it, oh, we've got three inches. This rain gauge records rain as it falls at five minute intervals. So we know not only how much was the total rainfall, we know how much of it fell in what time period, because it's all recorded uh, against time. So we're able to get not just the amount of rainfall, but the rainfall intensity, and intensity is important uh, if you're trying to predict flooding. Uh, floods happen when you have intense rainfall, and less so when the rainfall is gentle and not intense. This rain gauge was more or less in the middle of the Breedings Mill Branch uh, watershed. We also needed to know how deep was the water in a flood event 
flowing through the canal? How deep was the water in Inzer Sink? How deep was the water in Tyrus' Spare Cave and other places? And to get that kind of data, we purchased uh, four data loggers known as trolls. And this again with the uh, city's uh, money. Thank you. The trolls are fairly expensive and they can record uh, a variety of data. Uh, because they're expensive, we didn't want them stolen. This one, uh, this picture shows Sid downloading onto uh, a laptop computer data from a troll, which was buried under riprap in the mouth and the swallow of Inzer Sink. Buried so that kids or anybody that happened to go in there and found it wouldn't say, oh, that's cool looking, I think I'll take it home. Uh, we also had to uh, use a little imagination to camouflage the uh, data logger that we had in Reedy's Mill Branch Canal, since there was nothing we could hide it under. We built a fake drainage pipe, and the uh, troll data logger sits down here, uh, recording water depth, and the electrical conduit from it go up there, and we could connect our computer back over there. So, with this data logger, we would, would what record the changes in depth in water flowing through Breeding Mill Branch Canal. The geometry of the canal is fairly simple. Near vertical wall, sloping wall, near flat bottom, sloping wall, near vertical wall. We know the geometry, you can measure it, you can draw it on uh, graph paper. Uh, with the data from the data logger, we know fluctuations in depth, and we could go down there and cost uh, a floating object in and measure the distance it traveled in a set amount of time to get the velocity. So with the cross-section of the canal, the depth of the water, the velocity of flow, we could tell how much water was discharging through the canal into Inzer Sink. Turns out that the canal design will permit brimful flow, that is with water right up to the brim of the canal, brimful discharge of about 1,000 cubic feet per second, which is a lot of water. But our calculations based on rainfall and the uh, drainage basin area uh, indicate that we can expect the Breedings Mill Branch watershed to produce stormwater in quantities of up to 2,500 and even 4,000 cubic feet per second during the 100-year storm event, which we probably did not witness uh, during uh, our study. Obviously, the canal design is inadequate to carry the amount of water that the drainage basin can produce. All right. So we were able, though, to calculate uh, how much water the canal could discharge in the Inzer Sink at least as long as it was within the canal. When it got up and spread out beyond the bounds of the canal, it becomes much more difficult to calculate the amount of water. The volume of water temporarily stored in Inzer Sink when it floods is dependent on the level to which the sinkhole is flooded. The deeper the water, the more water, obviously. Uh, and also the Equally obviously, the configuration of the sinkhole itself. What's the shape of the sinkhole? It's not just a simple bowl, it's a weird shape. So, uh, we, I shouldn't say we, Sid calculated the uh, volume of the sinkhole at different levels of floodwaters based on the uh, two foot contour interval map and also uh, using uh, LIDAR. Uh, GIS techniques, uh, LiDAR uh, topography, and uh, the neat thing is that the two uh, coincide with each other just perfectly. The uh, red squares represent volume of water in the sinkhole based on the contour map, and the blue diamonds represent volume of water based on the LiDAR information. And what you have on the horizontal axis is elevation above sea level. This talk was prepared for a scientific meeting at the International Congress of Speleology a few years ago, so uh, figures in meters, and I know most people around here don't work in meters much, 
but it doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, the higher elevation you go to, uh, the greater the volume of water in the sinkhole. And Sid was able to calculate that at about 1,040 feet water level stage in the sinkhole, uh, the combined Inzersink and Walmart sink floodwater storage volume exceeds 100 acre feet, which is a pretty good chunk of water. But the storage is very, uh, very temporary. Uh, it floods rapidly, it drains rapidly, so it does not store water for a long time. The third thing we'd like to know is much more difficult to calculate or figure out, and that is how fast can the water drain out of Inger Sea. And that depends on uh, a lot of different factors. Uh, the size and geometry of the conduit or the cave that's taking the water. There are places where the cave is wide and tall, and water should flow through there very easily uh, with great volume. Uh, there are places where the cave is more constricted, and that's going to be uh, an area of resistance to flow and possibly cause backing up of water uh, in the cave. Um, the local gradient from uh, uh, Inger Sink down to Tires to Spare Cave is a factor. The steeper it is, the faster the water will flow. Local flooding uh, in that uh, little stream called the canal and other parts of the overall Cookville drainage system can also affect how fast Inger Sink drains. If you flood those areas, you're raising the water level in the cave, which effectively lowers the gradient, gives you a lower slope for the water to flow down. And uh, another factor is how deep is the water in the sinkhole. The deeper it is, the greater the pressure at the bottom of the sinkhole, and the faster water will be forced down through the hole. So uh, quite a few uh, factors uh, involved there make it a bit difficult to determine uh, what are the drainage rates of the sinkhole? It is evident from direct observation at Inger Sink that Inger Sink floods very, very rapidly and drains rapidly. We also uh, made direct observation on one occasion inside Hires to Spare Cave of a flood event. Uh, we won't be doing that again for a number of reasons, but. Uh, uh, it was impressive to see the water backing up behind this pile of breakdown. It was a raging stream. It was not full to the roof of the cave at that time, or we wouldn't have been in there, but it does fill to the roof of the cave from time to time. In any case, we had these data loggers in uh, Tires of Spare Cave and in Inzer Sink, which would tell us when the flood was at its greatest, at its crest, its peak stage. And what we learned is that the flood crests in Inzer Sink 30 minutes to as much as two hours before the flood crests in Tires to Spare Cave. And what this tells us is that although both points flood rapidly, the flooding in Tires to Spare Cave is not the cause of flooding at Inzer Sink. If it was the cause of flooding in Inzer Sink, you'd have to flood there first and then back up to Inzer Sink. But instead, it flood maximizes peaks in Inzer Sink and then starts down before Tires to Spare reaches its peak flood. So at least at the time of this study, which was 1998 to 2002, <coughs> uh, that pile of breakdown that is collecting trash and causing water to back up in the cave, at least at that time, it was not the cause of flooding in Inzer Sink. We think it may in some future date be the cause. That's a couple of representations of Inger Sink merged with Walmart Sink, uh, showing the two modes of, of getting the volume there from LiDAR topography and the conventional topo map. That uh, may or may not be a 100-year flood event, but it is an event where the two sinkholes are uh, merged into one. The upstream sump at Tires to Spare Cave is a place where the ceiling of the cave comes down very rapidly. There's no concomitant widening of the cave. 
nor does the floor go down as far as we can tell by wading in until we couldn't breathe anymore. Uh, so this apparently represents a, uh, a real significant uh, constriction in the cave here. Uh, it might be something that causes uh, water to back up in the cave. It might not be. It is probably one of several such constrictions in the cave that lies between this point and Inzer Sink. But we may never know unless we get divers in there, and I don't know any divers that want to do that. The upshot is there are a lot of factors that control how fast water can drain out of the sink, but it can be expressed this way. Inflow, that's water from Breeding's Mill Branch Canal, which we can uh, measure and calculate pretty well, minus outflow through time, delta T, equals the change, whoops, the change in volume in the sinkhole itself. And we were able to either calculate or measure the inflow. Uh, the change in time was measured for us by the instruments, and we could measure the change of volume in the sinkhole, and uh, that leaves us only one unknown. So you rearrange the equation to solve for outflow, and uh, it uh, you know, sounds pretty simple. I couldn't do it. Simply. And uh, what do we get? Uh, well, uh, what we know is that outflow is not as fast as inflow, and that's why we have this flooding. Uh, during the time period that we were studying this drainage system, we recorded 18 flood events uh, in which the water was greater than 20 feet deep in Inzer Sink. The maximum flood event uh, had a water depth of 38 feet at the cave entrance. And these are the events that flood the nearby streets and homes. But uh, most of them were smaller than that. This shows the results of some of Sid's calculations on three different flood events. These are drainage rates. And what Sid found was that if the sinkhole is flooded to a depth of about 20 feet, the cave will swallow water at a rate, will drain at a rate of about 150 to 160 cubic feet per second. If you flood the sinkhole to a greater depth and there's more water pressure, flood it to about 30 feet, it'll swallow about 260 to 280 cubic feet per second. These figures are more or less an order of magnitude less than the input rates. No wonder it floods. The data logger that we had in Intersync and we had another one in Walmart sink, gave us some interesting information. The blue dots represent the water level in Inzer sink. The floor of Inzer sink is topographically lower than the floor of Walmart sink, represented by the red dots. And uh, so when there's little or no water going into the cave, the data logger says this. When the cave starts to fill with water, the data logger starts uh, recording deeper and deeper uh, water levels at both sinks and simultaneously, or nearly simultaneously. These two peaks are off a little bit. These are dead on simultaneous. Inter sink and Walmart sink flood simultaneously. That tells us, we believe, that there is a constriction in the cave system a short distance downstream from Walmart sink. So when water backs up due to this constriction, it affects both sinks simultaneously. We have thought for a long time uh, that the constriction causing flooding in Wal in Inzer sink was not very far downstream in the system. Uh, we now think that the it's downstream enough that uh, it's a constriction that affects both sinkholes simultaneously. However, during one flood event, let's see, this was April 1998, you've seen this picture before. When I was standing out in the water there, I could see the water flowing across the land. I think maybe I could even feel it. 
how, in any case, there is visible flow from engine sink towards Walmart sink, meaning it is easier for the water to go down into the cave system over there in Walmart sink than it is in Pinzer sink. So we think there's a constriction downstream from Walmart sink that makes these two sink holes flood simultaneously. We think there's another constriction between the two sinks that impedes water flow into Pinzer sink so that when it gets up to this level, the water finds it easier to go over there and go underground. Obviously, the best known constriction in the entire drainage system is this one that we have walked around on, clambered over, and photographed. And this is the upstream end of the breakdown pile in tires to spare cave. You've got to go through uh, 100 feet, perhaps, of uh, breakdown in order to get back into the entrance room of the cave. I should tell you now, I guess, that uh, this is a historic picture. Uh, you can't take this photograph anymore. Uh, Chuck uh, and I and another caver went uh, over to uh, Tires to Spare Cave last week to get in to see what the current situation is and the crawl space that used to allow us to get back in here no longer exists. I don't know if it's filled up with sediment or if the rocks have shifted and it's closed down or some combination of both, but we can't get up there now to see just what's uh, going on. So this is a filter. It is collecting urban trash. And like all filters doing its job, it ultimately will be so clogged up it can no longer pass the fluid that it has been passing. And when that happens, this pile of breakdown that was not a cause of flooding in injure sink during the study period will become a cause of flooding in injure sink. And injure sink can be expected to flood more often and more deeply if this becomes totally plugged up. What's the likelihood of that happening? I consider it a certainty in time. How much time? Don't know. But here's what we saw uh, a few years ago. In 1994, this is one of the 30 tires. This one's actually inflated, still on its rim. It floated through the cave a mile or so into the cave and lodged about eight feet above the cave floor, obviously floating in water to get up there, lodged in the breakdown pile. In 1994, you could still see the rim and almost all the time. In 2009, this breakdown had become choked up with sticks, pieces of plastic, bottles, cans, so much so that the entire rim is completely buried now and invisible and only the outer portion of the tire can be seen. Incidentally, when I took these two pictures, the first picture I was standing in water maybe an inch deep, two inches max, water flowing through the breakdown. When I took the second picture, I was standing in water a foot, foot and a half deep. Now that could be just from different seasons, and maybe there was just more water flowing through the cave uh, when the second picture was taken. It may also mean that the breakdown at that lower level is plugging up and is not able to pass the water as freely as it did before. We don't know. But this picture clearly documents that the breakdown is in the process of becoming plugged up. And if it becomes completely plugged up, what then? Loss of this natural storm sewer system provided by Mother Nature for the city of Cookville would require an engineered replacement by Dr. Jones' calculations, you'd need a four foot in diameter minimum drainage pipe. It would have to be laid in a trench dug for approximately 4,000 feet from Enzer Sink over to Tire to Spare area. Digging this trench would not be in dirt, much of it would be in bedrock, perhaps 10 or more feet of bedrock having to be excavated. The tile, the drainage, pipe would have to be laid on a grade so the water would flow downhill. It would cut through some of Cookville's most important commercial zones. It would slice through South Jefferson. Uh, it would be a major inconvenience to <coughs> commerce and traffic while this was being done. 
it would be a major expense. Uh, it would be, to put it mildly, a major hassle, and the city would like to avoid that, I'm sure. And we made some recommendations to the city that we thought would help avoid the necessity for a man-made drainage replacing this natural storm sewer. First of all, Inser Sink needs to be cleaned out again, including removal of the riprap that was placed in there and has washed into the swallow. Secondly, and most important, we need a trash rack to be installed, a mechanical strainer of sorts. Uh, Dr. Crawford here has installed those sorts of things in uh, Bowling Green, uh, Kentucky, and knows about them. Uh, we need a trash rack placed near the end, the downstream end of the Breedings Mill Branch Canal to strain out the solid waste matter that is being washed into Inter Sea. If you put the trash uh, rack in there and walk away from it, it too will clog up and become a local point of flooding. So the trash rack would need to be inspected regularly and maintained, that is trash picked out of it and carted away as needed. We recommend the installation of one or two smaller trash racks further upstream in the Breeding Mill Branch Canal and appropriate maintenance. And we <coughs> recommend the installation of more fencing further upstream from the uh, canal in the presently unfinished, unfenced sections, partly to enhance the safety of kids and also partly to prevent more trash from getting into the canal. Some of it would be caught by the fencing. Unfortunately, 22 years after the Tires to Spare cave collapse took place and this potential drainage problem was first reported to the city in 1994, 12 years after our study was completed and turned into the city, as far as I can tell, virtually nothing has been done. I am informed by a city engineer that uh, about once a year they have a cleanup using volunteer help uh, directed by the city to get people into the sink and pick up and carry away uh, trash. They haven't been moving the riprap, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, I'm also told that the city is considering the construction of a sump basin which would collect bed load, heavier than water pieces of trash washing into the sink, combined with some sort of a floating boom that would rise and fall with the flood levels in the uh, Inser Sink flood pool and would skim off the floating trash. They've been talking about this for several years. No design has been finalized. In my opinion, that sounds like it's really more complex than it needs to be, and a simple trash rack would probably suit the job better. But essentially, nothing has been done. And uh, when Kaya to Spare Cave will finally plug up, nobody can say. Maybe not during this present council's term. Maybe not for another 20 years. <coughs> but it's almost certain to happen. And I do believe the city would be wise to uh, take some steps to prevent that from happening and avoid a truly major engineering expense somewhere down the road. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, let's sit in for it. <laughs>